Hi, in the previous clip I introduced the declarative and constitutive theories of statehood. Now one thing that neither theory addresses in any great detail are claims of peoples to self-determination and independence. And this is arguably surprising because these movements, these claims, have arguably been some of the most important historical factors that have recently driven the creation of new states in the international legal system. I'd like to use this third and last clip to discuss these Topic starting first with a brief recount of the recognition of the rights of people during the decolonization period, moving on then to the more contemporary practice regarding the right to self-determination, and end with the discussion on the relevance of statehood to bring forth why these kinds of claims are both so popular and so important. Now I believe that everybody will be familiar with at least some examples of such claims and of such peoples. Think for example of the Kurdish people who remain divided between the territories of Turkey, Iran and Iraq. Or think of the example of Kosovo, which unilaterally declared its independence in 2008, but remains in a state of contested statehood. Or finally think of course of the Palestinians, already briefly addressed in the previous clip, and their claim to self-determination, which is being undermined very much by the occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Now, addressing these kinds of examples it might seem that they are very specific and relatively rare. However, in a historical context, there have been many examples of these kinds of movements, also referred to in international national liberation movements, that in particular during the 1950s, 60s and 70s, came to build the international community as we know it today. This period is known as the era of decolonization, in which former colonies, subjugated by European, by Western powers, gradually, one by one, came to obtain independence and statehood. This process was steered by the United Nations and it arguably remains one of the biggest achievements of the UN to have been able to bring about this transformation of the international order in a relatively peaceful manner. Now, understanding these claims and these processes is relevant not just from a historical and a political perspective, but they also throw up important legal questions, particularly in a contemporary context where a claim to statehood usually also means a claim for secession. So, one state's gain of independence and of self-determination is the loss of a mother state of a territory and potentially even a larger breakup that threatens the integrity of that state. Think, for example, of the breakup of the USSR, which has ripple effects until today, and I'm talking, of course, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Another equally striking example is the breakup of the former Yugoslavia into multiple smaller regions and now states, which took place in a very violent manner, which included multiple civil wars and thousands and thousands of casualties. One legal principle that can help us understand how these processes unfold and should unfold, what the legitimacy of various claims are, is the principle and indeed the right to self-determination. Expressed, for example, in Article 1.2 of the UN Charter, where it is described as an inherent right of peoples, next to, for example, the equality of states and sovereignty. It is crucial to understand right from the outset that the right to self-determination does not entail an automatic right to secession. In fact, there is an internal and an external dimension to the right to self-determination. In most contemporary contexts, internal self-determination is being granted, meaning that a people will have to accommodate their claim within the constitutional framework of a state, which, however, in return, is obliged to offer a degree of autonomy to respect the rights and to respect the cultural self-determination of these people that will remain within their state. External self-determination, on the other hand, is limited to a process of decolonization, and therefore by now mostly historical. So it is really limited to those examples that we have just discussed of former colonies gaining their independence in the 1950s, 60s and 70s from Western powers through statehood and through complete independence and complete detachment and autonomy from these former colonial empires. In a contemporary context, secession is only an option, even then it is very controversial when internal self-determination is being denied, meaning that the mother state does not provide for the necessary constitutional accommodation and that it perhaps suppresses and even persecutes individuals that belong to this people. Now, in such a context, potentially, there is a legitimate claim to self-determination outside the mother state. Now, the applicability and indeed the legal framework that I just explained was outlined by the Canadian Supreme Court 
in a landmark decision called the Secession of Quebec, where it was confronted with the question whether, in fact, the people of Quebec had a legitimate claim to secede from Canada. And the answer then was that no, as long as the Canadian state was respecting the rights, the cultural rights, most notably of this minority of the Quebecian people, such a claim would not arise and internal self-determination was the way to go. That said, new states still do come about today or in relatively recent history. For example, through the dissolution of states, I already mentioned the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, but also and most notably when the mother state agrees to secession. And this was the case, for example, with South Sudan, which is the newest state to gain independence and gain wide recognition in the international community. In the case of South Sudan, independence came about through a process of referendum. And this referendum, which was held in 2011, was in fact a part of a peace agreement that was concluded already in 2005, which had ended a civil war between, on the one hand, rebel forces in the south and the Sudanese main state, the mother state. And eventually 98% or even 99% of people, South Sudanese people, voted for independence, which was then subsequently granted by the Sudanese state. It should be mentioned that the new South Sudanese state kept the borders of the Sudanese mother state, thereby giving effect to the international law principle of uti possidetis juris, which basically suggests that any kind of creation of new states, any kind of independence, does not actually alter the borders that are there, which is important in so far as it preserves the integrity of neighboring states. I'd like to end this clip by briefly discussing, or I should more accurately say summarizing, why statehood is relevant. And of course, we have touched upon many of the aspects that I will mention here already. More specifically, and this really brings us full circle from the first clip, there are various rights and duties that are attached to being a state. The rights are particularly attractive to those peoples that are striving for external self-determination and secession. And this includes, on the one hand, of course, a place in the community of states, sovereign equality, as it is also called. So each state and international system is actually, legally speaking, equal to the other, but also exclusive jurisdiction over a territory. And this is particularly important when ethnic conflict and when factions between various population groups are, in fact, what triggers the very aspiration to be independent. There is also the inherent right to self-defense under the UN Charter with, of course, the corresponding duty of not engaging yourself in a legal use of force that does not amount to self-defense. I will not discuss this much further here because we will, in a few weeks down the road, talk about this in detail. Statehood also brings about the ability to engage in interstate, international relations, including diplomatic relations, but also, and more importantly for us in this course perhaps, to conclude international agreements and to enjoy the benefits of these agreements, be they economic or environmental or related to peace and security. This last aspect draws our attention to the United Nations as the principal maintainer of peace and security in the international system, and statehood entails the ability to join the UN or for that matter any other international organization, which, as we have seen in the previous clips, operate in many different fields of law. The final aspect and one that shouldn't be underestimated is that statehood offers new opportunities for the pursuit of justice, most notably in the context of the International Criminal Court, which any state can accede to and which then would cover the whole jurisdiction of this new state. Once again, we'll cover this topic in much greater detail in a few weeks down the road when we talk about international criminal law. But drawing attention to international crimes such as crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes already proved very attractive to the Palestinian authorities, which in 2015 joined the ICC, which by now also has investigations pending, including on acts committed by the IDF, Israeli Defense Force, in the Gaza Strip. This concludes the videos for this week. I very much look forward to discussing all these fascinating topics with you in class.